celebrates the seventh Texas Muslim Capital Day. We are honored, thank you. I proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over the capital of Texas. I stand against Islam and the false prophet Muhammad. Lady, do the cause of Christ a really huge favor. Shut up about Jesus and about being a Christian. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned. I'm going to give you my two cents worth. And welcome to this edition of My Two Cents Worth. Please uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, click on the subscribe bar, and when the notification bell pops up, click on it. You'll be notified anytime I add content to the channel. Like these videos, give them a thumbs up if you particularly like it, comment on these videos, share these videos. All right, let's get into this. Christians behaving badly. Uh, it happens more times than we care to admit, and we've all encountered them. Maybe it's someone uh, out in public who just cusses up a blue streak or you're, you're at a restaurant and the Christian at the table next to you, his order isn't quite right. So he raises a big fuss like Armageddon is coming. And then you get ones that are kind of comical in a way and become fodder for Saturday Night Live skits. This guy, Jesse Duplant du Duplantis and his uh, $60 million, whatever it was, private jet that he wanted. Let's have a little more to say about him momentarily. But for purposes of this video, I want to point out we are using a broad definition of the word Christian. These are people that I would most likely not fellowship because, so far as I know, they have not been added to the church, uh, as we see in Acts chapter 2. Uh, they're definitely preaching another gospel. But what I want to look at is I'm going to break this down into two segments. We're going to do one here about Christians and hate. How Christians can sometimes just come across as very hateful, and sometimes I think they are. Like these people, the uh, Westboro Baptist Church, founded in 1955 in Topeka, Kansas by Fred Phelps, uh, who was a lawyer, and from what I can gather was probably, uh, just as lawyers go, not bad at his craft. Uh, he ended up getting disbarred in the early 70s and just devoted himself full-time uh, to his church and turned it into just a bunch of hate mongers. The church owns a building and owns a lot of the houses around it, so it's the whole block is kind of like a, a compound or a little city within a city. Phelps died in 2014 at the age of 84, but he had 13 children, 54 grandchildren, and uh, at the time of his death, seven great-grandchildren. And uh, since then, a lot of the younger uh, second and third generation people have left. Uh, you can go on YouTube and see uh, TED Talks and other videos by some of the young people who've left there. The first book review I did on this channel was called Banished, and it was by one of the young ladies, not related to Phelps, but uh, her parents got mixed up and uh, she left and was basically disfellowshipped, excommunicated, banished. Uh, hence the title of the book, and even at least one of his granddaughters has renounced the group and left it. Now, about the lady you saw in the opening clip. We're going to go and have a look at that full clip. This is the Texas Capitol Muslim Day. I don't know what year it was, but I want you to watch this woman, and then as she walks away from the lectern, the camera's going to pan to the ground for a bit, and then it's going to come right back up, and you're going to see a Texas state trooper there admonishing the woman to stay behind a certain line, and then right before the clip ends, listen to what this woman says, this professing Christian says. Okay, all set? All right, let's roll the tape. Celebrates the 7th Texas Muslim Capital Day. 
We are honored. Thank you. I proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ over the capital of Texas. I stand against Islam and the false prophet Muhammad. Islam will never dominate the United States, and by the grace of God, it will not dominate Texas. I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, now, understand I am a Christian. I believe Jesus Christ is the only path to salvation, and everybody needs to know that. And if you reject it, it's between you and God, but from what the Bible says, you're not going to heaven. Now, all that said, we do have the First Amendment in this country, and those Muslims have every legal right to practice their faith that we do. And as far as I can tell, they were not advocating any violence like a lot of Muslims do. They were peaceful. They, I'm sure, had whatever permits and things that they needed to have that protest. That woman and her group were completely out of line. Now, to go there and observe, ask questions, I don't think there should be a problem with that. Uh, if I were there, I might carry some business cards or some tracts or something to hand out just if, if I got the opportunity. But I'm not going there to seize the microphone and create a big scene. And what they did there was just hateful, and it was stupid. Now, speaking of Christians and doing and saying stupid stuff, this next one, I wasn't sure if I should put it under hate or just stupid stuff. It's definitely stupid. But this man, and this is from 2014. It's not real recent, but uh, Happy Valley Church of Jesus Christ, it's in Tennessee, uh, I think out in the Chattanooga area, but I'm not positive. But he preached a sermon, and I'm going to put the clip up here, uh, where he said interracial marriage is wrong. And I, I'm, I like context, so I'm going to play the clip here, and then I'm going to come back and give you my two cents worth on it. All right, so let's roll the tape. There's a move in the message of blacks marrying whites, whites marrying blacks, and folks think it's all right. But you know what? My God still has nationalities outside the city. Now watch this. Brother Bram says, how breeding, how breeding, how terrible how breeding. The hybrid, the people. They, it's a big molding pot. I got hundreds of precious colored friends that's born again Christians. But on this line of segregation and things that they're talking about, how breeding the people, what? Tell me what a fine cultured, fine Christian colored woman, fine Christian colored woman, would want her baby to be a mulatto by a white man. No, sir. It's not right. Now, it wasn't long after that that he, in fact, backtracked on it uh, and said that um, he's not really a racist. He simply doesn't marry interracially. Mm, okay. Uh, if you don't want to do interracial marriages, that's up to you. That's your business. But what he said really rubbed me wrong, and I do think is racist. Now, in the interest of disclosure, my wife and I are both white. We have a daughter. She's adopted, and she's black. Now, if I were in that community looking for a church home, and I heard that when I'm sitting in the audience, we're walking out. We're not even waiting for the end of the service. We're walking out, and he's getting an email or a phone call from me and explaining why we left and why we're not coming back. Uh, that's not the kind of thing I want my daughter to be exposed to. That's not the kind of thing she should be exposed to. But uh, if, you know, that's the kind of church you go to and, and uh, you don't want, mix, you know, that's between you and God. I think it's racist and it's not anything that I would want to be a part of. And so I've got a couple of other uh, uh, clips here. This one here of this guy, I guess he was a youth pastor, minister at one time. And this is, is another one. I don't even know if this for real happened. He uses a real name of a youth but listen to what he did, and um, let's just roll the tape. He was a nice kid, but he was one of those kids that was always just, he's a real smart aleck. He was, was, was a bright kid, 
which didn't help things, right? Made them more dangerous. And we were outside one day, youth group, and uh, he was just, just trying to push my buttons, and he was just, you know, kind of not taking the Lord serious. And I walked over to him, and I went, bam! I punched him in the chest as hard as I, I crumpled the kid. I just crumpled him. And I said, I leaned over and I said, Ben, when are you going to stop playing games with God? I led that man to the Lord right there. There's times that that might be needed. Okay, if that were my son, me and that guy are going to have issues. You don't go around punching people in the chest like that. That was a stupid thing to say. And in fact, legally, he could have been charged with assault. Uh, so, I, you know, if, if I were uh, in uh, an elder or a minister or somehow in a church and the youth minister did that, he's gone. He's out of there. We are not having that. And you don't even think about using us as a reference because or using me as a reference because I'm not going to give you a good one. That right there, you just blew your credibility. I have a feeling if God could come down today, or if he did, he could if he wanted to. If he came down and said uh, and talked to his people, talked to Christians, I think this is something here that he would tell us. Stop using me as an excuse to say stupid stuff and probably say to say and do stupid stuff. Now, not all Christians who say and do stupid stuff are, are malicious. So a lot of them, I think, have their hearts in the right place. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're out, oh, they're in over their head. For instance, this uh, I found this online about the 10 dumb things smart Christians believe. And uh, there's about five of them, I think, here. I just wanted to give you a sampling. Here's a kind of a blow up of the um, of the of the uh, of the list. Saying that faith can fix anything. God brings good luck. Forgiving means forgetting. Everything happens for a reason. And a godly home guarantees good kid, uh, good kids and more. You know, and like I said, just because everyone believes it doesn't make it true. I've known some kids that came up in good godly homes, and some of them are doing, did heavy time in prison. Uh, some of them left the faith, and there's various, no two situations were alike. There's various reasons why that happened. In some cases, I think the parents just went about it wrong. Everything happens for a reason. It sounds okay, but, you know, okay, what's the reason that my three-year-old just got hit by a car and died okay you want to be careful with that the problem here is that in our culture we don't deal with tragedy very well our western culture doesn't deal with death and dying and, and tragedy much at all now if you look at the book of job when his three friends arrived what did they do nothing they sat for seven days seven whole days didn't say a word sometimes that's all you need to do is just be there and not say anything but a lot of times, I think in these situations, a Christian's heart is in the right place, but the head just isn't up to the task. Now, I'm going to insert this montage clip of Christian saying and doing stupid things. And these are things that get into the press and they make us all look bad. So uh, here again, we're going to roll the tape. Daniel claims to heal the sick and even cast out demons. Daniel's followers are totally under his control, but some of his methods have raised eyebrows. Congregants are made to eat grass, and Daniel insists it's an instruction from above. He refused to take questions from journalists. In March, water began dripping down a statue of Jesus on the cross at Our Lady of Velankani in Mumbai. Parishioners collected the so-called holy water. Others drank it, hoping it would cure ailments. But rationalist and atheist Sanal Edamaruku investigated and said it was actually sewage water percolating through the statue because of a leaky water pipe. The priest stopped to pray for a while for this water to be distributed. And he has been giving this water, the assistant priest has been distributing this water and brought to me also, people were given in a spoon from their pub and they were just licking it without knowing what it was. Now he's being charged with blasphemy under Section 295A of the Indian Penal Code. Patty Burke eats pounds of goldfish crackers each week, but last week she found one she believes is a sign from God. I pick them up one by one and I look at each individual 
goldfish. And when I picked this one up, I knew he was special. <laughs> he had a cross on him, and he had a crown circle up by his head, something I'd never seen before out of all the goldfish I've eaten. I was like, this is a special goldfish. Patty thinks it's a sign that God is present in her everyday life. Up one at a time and look at it, you know, and, and I, maybe that's why the Lord chose me, because mm -hmm. he knew I wouldn't eat it before it could be made known. And now my personal favorite, tele-evangelist, said he sarcastically. These probably, these people probably grate on my nerves more than any other phony Christians. These people, this is the so-called Word of Faith, Prosperity Gospel. I think it's got several different names. But when they go out, now listen, let me back up. I'm pretty libertarian when it comes to uh, earning a living and making money. In other words, I don't begrudge anybody making a big salary, even preachers. I know preachers that make six-figure salaries or close to it. Uh, that's their base salary from their church. And then some of them get royalties for their books. They get speaking fees, things like that. Hey, if, if whatever you, you do, if you sweep the floors and you're good enough and someone wants to pay you a million dollars to sweep their floors, great, go for it. That's up to you. If you're a minister and you can make a, a, a good salary, great, go for it. I really don't care. What gets on my nerves are people like Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, and Crefano, or Sir Frano Dollar, however he pronounces his name, just constantly wanting more and more and more. When people like him, they need a private jet to fly around. And then Kenneth Copeland, who has an estimated net worth at around $700 million, uh, I've heard it as high as a billion dollars, his house, he's got two private jets, and I don't think you can see it in this picture here, but he's got a private airstrip behind his house. And he started out as Oral Roberts' uh, pilot, and Oral Roberts is one of the original prosperity gospel uh, uh, false teachers. And that's a whole other story for or, or discussion for another time. But these guys are just thinking about their own pockets, their own wealth, their own uh, uh, comfort. They could give that money to orphanages. They could give it to feed people. They could use it to invest in businesses and provide jobs. Uh, for people, but they don't. They spend it on themselves. Here's the Atlanta Journal and Constitution from June 3rd, 2015, when uh, uh, Mr. Dollar uh, wanted a $65 million jet. Now, he could have gone out and built houses with that. He could have uh, invested in some businesses with that money and put people to work, send people to school. To, you, you know, all this talk about forgiving student loans and student debt. How many student debts or student loans could he have paid off uh, with that if he really wanted to be generous? Now, the whole issue of student loan forgiveness, well, that's another discussion for another time. But if he really, my point is, if he really wanted to be helpful to people, he could have put that money to a whole lot better use than buying himself a private jet. And I know he did provide some jobs for the people who built the jet and delivered it and maintained it, sure, but he could have provided a whole lot more uh, by wisely using that money. Now, here's another problem we have in the church. Uh, with Christians behaving badly, and that is division. Now, before I became a Christian, I, for a time, there was pretty hostile towards Christianity and any kind of religion. And this is one of the reasons. If, if there is a God, why are there so many different churches and different religions, each one teaching something different? Now, eventually, I got smart as I studied the Bible and realized that Satan's best tool is division. But I want to take a look at it right now. Because if ever there was uh, a church and Christians behaving badly... It was these guys, the church at Corinth. Now, this is really exhibit A for when you're looking for a church and you're looking for the perfect church, forget it. I mean, after all, if you did uh, place membership, join that church, you just dropped it from perfect to imperfect. Now, same thing if I go there. I'm going to ruin the perfectness of the church, okay, because I'm not perfect. But Corinth was pretty bad. They had a lot of issues. Now, we start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, I want you to notice something. Where Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice this is a church that is far from perfect, as we're going to see. But look at uh, verse 2. He still calls them the church of God, 
which is at Corinth. In other words, they're still God's people. They're imperfect. They are screwing things up, but they're still God's people. Now, he's going to try and correct some of these problems that they've got there. Dropping down to verse 10, he says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So they're having problems. They're, they're internal strife. Now this I say, and here's the problem. This I say that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, that's Peter, or I am of Christ. Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now this gets taken out of context and misapplied uh, in discussions on baptism. Paul's point is really not baptism. His point is division. Uh, they were you know, saying, hey, I was baptized by Cephas or Peter. I'm better than you. Well, I was baptized by Apollos. Or, well, I was baptized by Paul. They were splitting into factions. Now, today, we don't do it quite that way. But we will say things like, well, I'm a Baptist. Yeah, well, I got you beat. I'm a Catholic. We go all the way back to the you know, whatever, 6th century or whatever it is. But, yeah, well, I'm Lutheran. Well, I'm, and I hate to say this, I cringe, Church of Christ. No, you're not. You're just a Christian. Another discussion for another time. Point being is he's getting on them about their division. We've got the same divisions today. We need to unify on what the scriptures say. And then let's drop down to chapter 5, verse 1, where he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. Now, Corinth was a pretty immoral city. There were temple cults there and sex cults there, and uh, created a lot of problems because, uh, unfortunately, then as now, society tends to influence the church rather than the other way around many times. There were some immoral activities going on between people and activities that you really should make them blush, but instead they were proud of it. Now, when this uh, a man has his father's wife, there's one of two ways to take that. It was either an incestuous relationship between a man and his mother, or it was a stepson-stepmother situation. Uh, either way, it was a sexual affair going on, and it's wrong, and it's immoral, and this, whatever it was, was something that was so bad, even the uh, heathen Corinthians didn't do, didn't stoop that low. But the Christians were. So Paul is trying to correct that. Not only that, but they were taking each other to court. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Now, my takeaway from that has always been, if I have a problem with another Christian, I should have other Christians judging it. I shouldn't be suing. Uh, besides, think about how that looks in the public. If, uh, let's say, I have a problem with the church and I sue the church or I sue uh, a Christian. Again, behaving badly. I mean, you, you might just have to suck it up and, and uh, deal with a loss uh, if you're going to be biblical about it. And then uh, chapter 6. And this is a big one. A doozy, kind of. Therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brother. And so, you know, it's kind of the pot calling the kettle black. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So the church in Corinth was trouble. It was the ultimate in Christians behaving badly. But notice he says, such were some of you. They came out of those lifestyles. And you notice he even said the homosexuals changed. So don't let anyone tell you that it's impossible to change. Besides, you can go on YouTube, and uh, there are testimonials from homosexuals, lesbians, gays, uh, who left that lifestyle and came out of it. Uh, and if they, if you're born that way and you can't uh, change it, then what about all these other sins that Paul lists? And that's another discussion for another time. And they weren't the only ones who had problems. The or the Thessalonian church also had their issues. Paul said, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, 
but admonish him as a brother. No, people are going to stray. But don't uh, count them as an enemy. Don't uh, curse them. We need to pray for those people who go astray. Those, those televangelists out there asking for millions of dollars, for, pray for their repentance. Because they're not going to want to stand before God one day uh, with all that money in the bank and the gospel not getting spread, uh, especially when they're spreading a false gospel. So pray for people who've gone astray. And then have a look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said, I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be uh, too severe, this punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. So that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to affirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you uh, to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sake in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not uh, ignorant of his devices. Now, back in 1 Corinthians, he talked about um, uh, people going astray and uh, having to withdraw from people. And apparently they did, but apparently they carried it a little too far. So now Paul's at the point of telling him, okay, look, enough's enough. Uh, if a person has repented and they've come back, you need to forgive them. You need to encourage them. You need to be praying for them and helping them get back on track. That's what he wants them to do. So here, what can we draw for conclusions? Well, number one, we have to confront sin. If someone is behaving badly, it needs to be confronted. Not, oh, you know, it's just the way he is. He's kind of a grumpy old man. or He just never really got on. Mm -mm. Confront them lovingly. Now, they may get mad and storm out, but hey, you did your part. You can't be responsible for other people's actions. And then remember, if you're not a Christian, you're right to be concerned about these things. You're right to be concerned about the multimillionaire televangelist wanting more money for jets and things like that. You're right to be concerned about that Christian at the restaurant or at that Walmart who's creating a scene. But remember, sins of the Christian do not alter the truth of the gospel. And I'll leave you with this illustration of what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, about 10 years old, our neighbor from two or three doors down was walking down the street looking for his kids. It was supper time. And in one hand, he had a pack of cigarettes and a lighter. And in the other hand, he had a lit cigarette. He was also a surgeon, a doctor, who you would think would have known better. I said, hey, doc, isn't smoking bad for you? And he just kind of turned and looked at me and mumbled something, probably something saying, hey, mind your own business, kid. But you know, even though he smoked, and I've known other uh, medical people who smoked, didn't eat right, didn't exercise, didn't follow any of the health advice that they're giving out. But you know what? Doesn't change the facts. The fact that doctors and nurses smoke doesn't change the fact that smoking's bad for you. The fact that they're overweight doesn't change the fact that obesity and being overweight is bad for you. None of that changes. The facts are there. So a Christian behaving badly, although it, it does look bad and it can make you question the gospel, it does not alter the truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, the same today, the same forever. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. That's all I have for this. That's my two cents worth. Leave your comments in the comment section below. If you have any questions, you can leave them there or send them to me at 2timothy4.2.3 at uh, 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. That's all I have for this video. We'll see you in the next one. I'm out.